Hey everyone, my name is Winston Liao. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining. I am the medical director at the Robert Graham Center and I'm also the chair of the Research Advocacy Committee for NAPCRAG and we're very grateful for you all joining us. As I mentioned in my email, um, we are approaching advocacy slightly differently this year. In the past, we have um, sent out alerts and we've tried to cast a very wide net in terms of advocacy. Um, and this year we decided to try a different strategy, which is to be a lot more targeted. So specifically, we identified people who were in specific um, congressional districts or states, um, specifically uh, those districts and states that had senators or uh, Congress people who were on key committees, uh, like the Appropriations Committee. And then we tried to identify those NAPCRAG members who lived in those uh, key districts. And that's you. So we have created an advocacy task force. And uh, we had a small uh, meeting associated with STFM. And so we had a training during that session. And we've actually gotten great feedback from that, meaning that we've had a lot of people uh, contact their uh, senator or congressperson's office. Uh, have visits, communicate our asks. Uh, and so today we have a couple of um, agenda items that we're going to do. First, Hope Winberg is going to talk about advocacy skills. And then after that, I'm going to follow up with these specific asks and give you some background about uh, what we're asking for. So when you actually talk to your um, senators and congresspeople, that you'll know exactly what. Um, what to talk about. Um, if you're like me, then doing this for the first time is probably a little bit scary. And uh, we hope to convince you that it's really not that scary and to give you the skills needed to be able to do it on your own. Uh, and of course, with support from, uh, from us and with the other people on the task force, uh, we're also gonna uh, plan to get together in NAPCRAG. So if you're in NAPCRAG, we hope to see you at uh, one of our meetings. Uh, there's a couple of housekeeping issues first. If uh, you have a question, uh, please uh, type your question into the questions portion of the GoToWebinar interface. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question that's slightly more complicated, just uh, put in your name and then I'll unmute, we'll unmute you. Um, but if you have a question that is pretty straightforward, you can also just type it and we'll try and address it as we go along. Uh, the other housekeeping issue is that we're going to be recording this, um, so just be aware that <laughs> uh, we're recording it. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Hope Winberg, who's going to be leading off our webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, at least I assume it's afternoon, depending on where in the country you are. Um, but welcome. We're really glad that you are joining us today. Um, we have some goals um, for the, this portion, at least, of the session. And for some reason, my slides are not advancing, so I don't know what happened there. OK. Um, and so we sort of we're trying to take the, the fear and the unknown out of this. And so by the end of, of at least the first hour, um, we think you'll be able to demonstrate some knowledge and competency in understanding the importance of advocacy of how a visit works with your member of Congress or any other legislator, how to find the tools that you might need to develop and build your advocacy skills further, because this one short webinar is probably not going to make you feel totally comfortable on your own, and also um, what opportunities um, there may be to begin to be an advocate, at least on the federal level, with some of the issues that Winston is going to talk about later. So as we start off, we're going to start with two poll questions. I'll let Hannah do that, it's related to where the audience is, basically. Yes. All right, I have just launched the first poll, which is, have you ever been involved in governmental advocacy at any level, local, state, or federal? So go ahead and select yes or no, and then submit. All right. Okay, so the results of that is 67% have been involved in governmental advocacy and 33% have not been involved in governmental advocacy. Okay. 
And then the go to the next one. Yep. The second the second poll is do you consider lobbying a dirty word? Yes or no? And I've just launched it. All righty. So that is 33% say yes and 67% say no. I wonder how that relates to the answers of the first question. The reason I ask that question, uh, the first question is obvious to find out uh, sort of whether folks have been involved before and, um, and want to either continue or you're just starting out at the very, very beginning or maybe even just in the contemplative stage. Um, but the second question is because I think part of the fear that people have is that they think that what they're doing is lobbying and that that's a dirty word. Um, and from my perspective, I'm the actual lobbyist. I am a registered lobbyist. The government knows all about me. They know the issues that I lobby on and who I represent. You are constituents and um, you are actually advocates, not lobbyists, but because you have a perspective and a voice to your representative and senators um, that is actually constitutionally protected. Um, so it's not related to um, being a lobbyist at all. So, but why do we want to do this? Why does advocacy matter? Well, basically, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And um, recent events at ARC that um, Winston will go into kind of tell that story about having to be there and be present and speaking about the issues um, that you want to be heard about. So when we, when we talk about advocacy, we basically talk about what do you care about? What are the issues that are of concern to you? So um, I just like this cartoon, you know, unless someone like you cares a whole lot, awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. Um, and I think we're to here today to give you some skills and to also talk about how this applies to NAPGREG and to research uh, funding for primary care research. Um, but you can apply these to any level of interest or involvement that you want to have on any other um, issues that are of concern at any kind of governmental level. And even some of these skills really apply to you as um, leaders in your institutions. So we start out just looking at sort of what, what are the mechanics of this, like who is approaching the legislator. I talked a little bit already about the difference between it, uh, constituents and the lobbyist and me being the lobbyist. Um, and then there's another group that, that we would call power drivers, and that could be constituents, that could be lobbyists, that could be personal friends. We'll go into sort of each of those um, in terms of who actually can gain the ear and gain the respect and have some influence over your legislators. So you're the constituents, um, and that's why we've identified you in way of, of sitting in key districts and states of uh, particularly um, appropriators for health issues like art. Um, and so you're the content experts. Your concerns are rooted in the community, in what's happening with uh, what you're doing. You have a local and a state perspective. You're the boots on the ground. You understand the system that you're working in. Your concerns often affect more than just you or members affect more members of the community, whether it's patients, whether it's the institution that you work in. Um, and honestly, you're usually trusted more by legislators. They listen to your concerns. And the legislator's job is to listen and to address constituent concerns, not necessarily the national concerns, but the constituent concerns. And they have a balance between when they consider themselves dealing with something on a national level versus a local level. And in almost every case, the local um, issue trumps, excuse the expression, everything else when you think about health care reform that's going on now. The lobbyists. So I may know more about the national scope of the issues um, since I represent national organizations, um, which I forgot to introduce myself. Um, I represent NAPCRAG and the other academic family medicine organizations like the chairs, the program directors, um, and STFM. Um, so I may have a, a wider knowledge of the breadth of the impact across the nation, um, and I have a knowledge of the legislative process. So potential other efforts that are going, maybe going on nationally, where other legislators may stand on the issues and what other groups with similar perspectives might be allies to work with to advance our goals and some potential strategies to move forward. 
And then there's power drivers, which, as I mentioned earlier, can really be um, almost in either of the other categories as well. So constituents can be power drivers, particularly ones that have relationships with their member of Congress or their senators, um, supporters, i.e., people that um, provide funding and financial support or just voters. Um, institutions within the district and state, the academic health center, the hospital, the economic um, power drivers um, are ones that have a little stronger input because it weighs heavily on the minds of the legislature in terms of decisions that they make that may affect the financial or economic well-being of their um, district or state. Um, and then other large national organizations that support your cause. If you notice in the health care reform debate when they talk about you know, doctors and their position on it, they, they cite the AMA, they cite the big broad um, umbrella organizations. So those are sort of the three categories of, of people that, that advocate and or lobby um, with legislators. What we're looking for is synergy. Um, we're, we want to work together to have the best possible outcomes. So we want to use your understanding of the concerns and problems that need to be addressed locally. We want to look at what some of those barriers to affecting our desired changes are. We want to share information that's bi-directionally. Bi -directionally. I need to hear from folks on the ground, constituents, when they've spoken to their member of Congress or what the issues are. Um, what your good stories are, what the data is in your local thing, and I can tell you how you can use that information to, the, to help the most within your um, relationships with your members. Um, and there was a, a question that, that came up um, saying that there was, was lamenting his inability to reach a real person at a senator's office, and so there are um, ways to understand how maybe we can do better either going to a local office if you can't reach the, the Washington office um, or discussing things personally with some staff that may be local. There are all sorts of ways to sort of get around some of these problems. Um, and sometimes when the phone lines are so busy, sometimes it's just because they're not answering them because they're, they're getting information that they don't want. But most of the time that means that something is working, that constituents are out there contacting them. So we can look together for some of the best levers and the best strategy to move forward on these issues. The bottom line is your impact is large and broad. Um, when you talk to a legislator, they have a much larger comfort level talking to a constituent. They know where you're coming from. They probably know some of the same people they, that you know if, you, if this is like a first time and you don't know them yourself. Um, you can help the legislator concentrate on the information and strategy um, rather than when I walk in there, they're questioning why is she saying this, what is the need that's out there, is it true need or is she just lobbying on behalf of, of other folks that she's paid to lobby for. So you actually give me imprimatur, you provide access to me so I can say, oh, well, I know that you've heard from Dr. So-and-so in your district about this issue of funding, so that helps give me some weight because you have the most um, power and weight locally. Um, you also provide some safety and security for the legislator. They um, feel like they're acting on something if they support your view that at least some portion of their constituents want. Um, and as I mentioned before, you give me imprimatur by uh, providing me access and, um, and value um, more so than I have on my own without you give you a case example, um, and this is not research related, this is graduate medical education related. Um, in 2015, um, the Academy has these residency program solution consultants um, who deal with um, GME and help programs um, get to higher levels and expert, and they identified multiple concerns that ha had to do with rural graduate medical education. Um, and so we developed a bunch of sort of asks that we would want to have some changes made, either legislatively or through regulation. So I go in and talk to a staffer who I know, who I've dealt with before, and I meet with, with him and, and go through sort of the list of the issues. I said we could really use Senator Barrasso's help on this. Um, and his, the very first response is, well, oh, these sound really good. These sound really reasonable. 
let me check with Dr. Murray, who's a constituent, who, who is their person, their go-to resource on either health questions, rural GME questions, whatever. So again, I can go in, they can like what I have to say, they can feel it's important, but until they get sign off on somebody back in the district that wants it or the state, um, it's, it's not going to happen. They, they want to make sure that this is something that their constituents um, support. So that's just a perfect example of, of how you can make a difference um, and, and also how you can help nationally um, with, with the work that I do. So I'm going to sort of briefly cut into some of the stuff that Winston's going to talk about later. But one of the things that we do is we have to have a goal. What's our advocacy goal that we're trying to achieve? You know, you, you're not going in there just to be a gadfly or just to chat about nothing. You, you're trying to bring about some sort of change. So for example, in this situation, we want to continue funding ARC at a robust level. Um, that's at least one of our, our asks. So then we look at, well, who can make that change? Well, your legislator. Um, so they're in, either in a key seat, and because we've identified you as having a legislator in a key position, that that's where you fit in. Or sometimes if they're not in a key position, they can talk to somebody else who is. Well, then how do you activate them to make your change? Well, you need to think about not just the data that you might have or the logic behind what you want, but you, you want to look at what's the story. Um, what, what is the emotional story that can help reach them to make them want to make the change that you have? So tell why ARC is important, why the work that it does is important. You know, tie it back to either a patient or a project that you've done that has helped the patients or the system. Um, what's lost by not funding ARC? Um, and, and again, try to capture them and get them emotionally involved because of that little um, sound bite is worth all the data in the world. Um, and also, if you, if, if you can't reach them sort of thinking of them as a big legislator, think about them as they're all patients or they all have family members affected by some of the issues that you might bring to them. If they're conservatives, they definitely want to be saving money. Um, and that might be a way to appeal to them. Um, again, looking at all the different ways that you can activate them to want to take your side. So when you go speak with them, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the options, because I know you've heard a lot recently in the news about you know calling your legislator, and that's fine if we have like big numbers, just leaving a voicemail and saying I you know I want you to vote this way or that way. But when you're actually wanting to explain a situation and have a conversation about some issue, um, then a visit is important. It doesn't have to be in D.C. Uh, it can be back home. And in, in August, they're all going to be home um, for their districts. They may not have town halls, some of them, but they have office hours and things, and you can try to um, get in with them then, or you can invite them to your institution um, and show them around and really talk about some of the issues that way. But that, that first visit is obviously the hard, hardest. For those of you that are clinicians, there's a loss of the power and control that you have in a visit. You're used to running a visit, not being sort of on the other end of being the supplicant or sort of allowing them to run it or control it. Um, and so what we're going to try to do here in the next few minutes is talk about what knowledge will be helpful to you to sort of make that black box disappear so that you have a little bit of comfort level going into these um, situations. Hey, ho. Oh. Yes. Oh, go for it, Hannah. We had a question come up. The question was, how valuable are the day on the hill or day at the hill capital events? Day at the Capitol, sorry. Oh, I see when you're like a state academy chapter or something is, is bringing everybody to the hill. Good, or Family Medicine Advocacy Summit. Yeah, so they're very valuable. Again, the question of your you're, one, you're not alone. Typically, you have other folks with you. So you have their strength in numbers. And, and also comfort level, but it's also you're bringing to them, them bringing to their attention issues that are of concern. It's more powerful if you do that when you already have a relationship with them or you use that to begin a relationship, to be the start of a relationship. So just going once a year to a Hill Day or to um, your state capital is not enough. It's, it's a good beginning, um, but it's not enough. But I, 
I don't have time here, but there are definite examples where when we've, with a family medicine congressional conference, which is now Family Medicine Advocacy Summit, have sent folks to the Hill with a specific act and have gotten responses, positive responses, and, and actually had some action come of them. So, um, so, so they can be very important. So one of the things, obviously, for the meeting um, is if you want to be prepared. And you can see from this, you know, I thought you were bringing the paint. Just you have to be organized. So here are the, some of the ways that you want to be prepared. Um, you want to know who your legislator is, their politics, their party affiliation, what committees they're on. You know, I would normally at this point say, you know, are they on a health committee? Can do they have jurisdiction over an issue that you care about? But all of you on this um, call, the answer to that question is yes. They are all. Um, appropriators dealing with um, with health issues and particularly with ARC funding um, and what's their track record on the various issues so well that sounds great but then how do you go about finding that typically you can go straight to their website every member of Congress and senator has a website and you can just google their name and get to that site and it will it will include a lot of this information your local newspapers also if you read them are ways to find out sort of where they stand on issues um, you want to know what your ask is. You want to be clear about it. So you want to review the issues. You want to know what your talking points are. So that's what we mean by preparation ahead of time. It also helps to have material ready to leave behind. And we will be posting um, like a one pager on this issue for you that you could use as a leave behind. And again, as I mentioned earlier, what's your story? What's your little anecdote or your um, sort of emotional hook that will help get them involved in what you have to say. Um, one of the other things that you want to be prepared for is, especially if you're coming to Washington as opposed to having meeting them in their district offices, is that you need to be prepared for the chaos. There's this opposition of competing interests. You have, especially on the House um, level, um, you, you have a, a staffer who is um, doing um, health, but they're also doing defense and they're doing social security and they handle environment and they handle a multitude of issues. So, and you've got everybody coming in and trying to talk to them. And sometimes it's busy, sometimes the vote bells will ring, sometimes they want you to walk with them in the to the elevator and so you have to like talk your piece on the way. So there is quite a bit of chaos um, that can go on. You typically only have a limited amount of time, 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes they stretch that if it's not a busy time, but, the, but you need to be prepared to get all your thoughts out within that 15 minute window. And the last thing that I always have to say is you have to be prepared for the use of the staffers. Everybody that goes to their first visit to the Hill comes back and says, oh my God, they look like they were 12, they were really young. Well, and, well, the average age is 26, not 12, although they, many of them do look to be very young. Um, but again, for those of you that are clinicians, think about what you were doing when you were 26. I mean, you were in residency, handling codes, life or death issues. This is policy. So don't dismiss these very smart, very educated um, staffers um, because they're young and they are the conduit to the member frequently. So um, they're critically important. So what are some of the etiquette of the engagement that you will have? One of the things that you want to do is thank the member or the staff that you're meeting with. You want to stay on message. Sometimes they just like to shoot the breeze with the constituent because then they don't have to say yes or no or I'll think about something. It's just a nice um, collegial time. Um, you also want to listen. You want to look to them for opportunities that you could help address their needs. Typically, they might raise a problem or a reason they can't be on your side. So don't dismiss that. Take it at, at face value and see if there are ways that you might be able to help address that concern. Um, you can't forget to make the ask. That happens a lot. Um, you're talking about the issue and you're explaining yourself, but you don't necessarily make the close and say, I need you to do this, or I would like you to do X. Um, can you do Y to help fix this problem? And then um, follow up. Make sure you know who on staff you should be following up with if you've met with the member, or if you can follow up with the staff, because typically 
they're not going to necessarily have an answer for you right away. And again, we don't want this to be a one-shot deal. You want to be able to develop relationships, and that follow-up is an important way to do that. Um, what are some of the don'ts for that? Don't be late. Um, it's, you may have to wait there, but think about what happens in a um, waiting room in a doctor's office. You're, you're the one that may be late, but the patients have to be there on time. Um, you don't want to argue with them. You can have disagreement over positions, but not don't turn it into an argument because you'll never win on that. Um, and there's no time to make your argument in such a way, but it will be off-putting and, and it won't be helpful. And again, don't make it political. Don't at all, no matter if you're on the same political spectrum as, as they are, don't make it into a political issue. Make it into either an economic one, a, a social justice one, whatever the, the cause is or the reason, um, but don't make it into a political one. Um, and I think this is really important and most folks don't really understand that as part of the fear is you don't have to be an expert. If they ask a question that you don't have an answer to, that's fine. Just say, you know what, that's a great question. I hadn't heard that before. I'll have to think about it or I'll have to go find out and I'll get back to you. That kind of goes back to that follow-up. It gives you a reason to get back to them. So don't ever feel that you should just make something up or answer a question off the top of your head if you don't have a good sense of what the answer is. And then also don't have multiple asks. You can't run in there with a laundry list because um, you need to have one top priority and you want them to address that. If you give them several, even if they're disposed to helping you, they'll end up having to pick one. Um, and so, or they'll ask you to pick one, and then you've sort of ruined your ability to get any of the others addressed. So for when you have a meeting and you're going in to talk to them, have one issue that you want to raise. Now, in that situation, it's not your job to tell them where to find the funding to accomplish your ask. That's a little game that they play, and the staffer might ask you, well, gee, we need an offset. If we're going to do this, it's going to cost money. We need to find a way to pay for it. That's their job, so you can tell them nicely that, oh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't know that you, you know better where you could find funding for, from programs that, that maybe can, can stand to lose some money, but that's not your area of expertise. Um, and it's not your job to prioritize your issues for them. Again, if you go in with like three or four issues, they're going to say, oh, well, what's your top priority? Don't fall into that trap. And the easiest way not to fall into that trap is to come in with just one issue. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's not your job to be an expert on all things. Although you do want to be a resource, and that resource can get expert information and opinion from others. Now, it is your job to be a good communicator. And what do we mean by that? Um, th there's several skills, and they should come pretty naturally through training and through just plain personality if you're in family medicine, perhaps not so easily if you're uh, a researcher, more introverted and not an extrovert, but these are all the things that you um, need to be aware of as you move forward with this. First and foremost is don't just talk, listen to what they say. Um, you want to have an exchange of ideas. It's a way to help build trust. You're not going in and saying, if you don't do this, I won't vote for you. What you're saying is there's a real problem. Can we work towards a solution? Is there a way that we can get to a point where it's a win-win um, for both of us? So you want to both identify your needs and identify their needs, sharing your concerns, and then sharing your expertise. Again, you can be a resource to them um, and provide them with, with help moving forward. So what does the first part of a visit look like? When you walk into their office, what do you do? Obviously, you introduce yourself. Not only who are you, but where are you from? And, and that's really key. It sounds sort of, well, of course you're going to do that. but if you're going into a legislator's office, you need to say, I'm from X city in this state. They need to know that you are truly a constituent, and they can place you and make, obviously, some stereotypical ideas, but it helps engage and it helps develop a relationship for them to kind of know where you are, both physically and not just with the, the issue that you have. And you want to talk about why you're here, they're meeting with them that day. What do you want? What is your specific ask that you are looking for from them? And again, we talked a little bit earlier, why should they care? What are the key points that would actively engage them that you could use as talking points? And specifically, what story, brief uh, story, 
do you have to tell? Um, and then, again, discussing that follow-up, that's part of maintaining the relationship. When are you going to get back in touch? When can you expect to hear back from them? If, that, if it goes that way where they have said something like, oh, I'll have to find out X, Y, or Z. So that's what, you, um, that's what your part looks like. What can you expect from them? Typically, a very gracious welcome. They know your constituents. They, they're trying to be nice. Um, they, you, you kind of, it looks like sometimes if there's a group of you, it looks like a game of poker where they're dealing out business cards. So you should have a business card of your own. If you're, we'll talk a little bit later about sort of being careful with your institution and what their um, efforts are. So you may need a personal one, which you can just print off like a Kinko, just get, or on your own computer with your name and phone number. Um, and so you exchange that. They will typically listen to you very attentively, um, wanting to know what you have to say. Again, I talked about the chaos. There will be distractions. Their phone might ring or buzz. Somebody might stop by and ask them a question. Um, what you're hoping for is that in that listening attentively, that they might ask some clarifying questions. Possibly they'll request more information from you. And then typically they'll give you an explanation of where the legislator is on that issue if they already have a position. And if they do already have a position, it would be good for you to know that uh, in advance. Or it may just be a thank you for your views. Um, we really appreciate hearing from you. And that's not a, um, that's not bad for it to be that. Most, most meetings are like that. That's how they end up. And that's why, again, developing a relationship over a long term rather than just this one visit, that's where that comes in where eventually that, oh, thank you for your views, becomes them really taking the time to look at that and to research it and to find out more information, potentially get back to you with some questions. Um, and, and it's a way to um, eventually get an answer to that question. But typically, you're not going to get that. And again, it's not a measure of success if you don't get them to say yes. Hey, Hope. Um, Jake is asking, how long should we expect the meeting to last? 10 to 15 minutes. You have to be prepared for it not to go longer than that. Sometimes they will, and if you're having a great discussion, that's wonderful, but you need to make sure you sort of have the ask up front in case you do have to close it down fast. They're very busy, and they've got people coming in right behind you to meet with them. So we'll talk a little more about maintaining the relationship. Um, Legislators can change, although typically members of Congress and senators, um, because of all sorts of reasons and name recognition and redistricting and all that stuff, end up staying in. But when somebody retires, it opens up, or sometimes there's a tough fight. Um, and so it's hard to maintain a relationship with your legislator and the staff. If they leave, the staff goes on to something else. But that's critically important to keep going with that. Um, so I have another question. Sure. sure. Um, can you bring some small token for them to remember you by? No, sorry. Uh, it has to be under $10 in value. So I would just stay away from that. Um, that's really the point of the business card. They'll, they'll know. Um, you can follow up. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit like with, a, with an email thank you. Um, even if you don't have any additional information that you need to impart, you can thank you email, reiterate your concerns. Um, but no, tokens are not. Now, I do know one guy from Michigan who always brings a cherry pie to his senator, like a homemade cherry pie, because I guess Michigan cherries. Um, that, that's one thing, but you know, I would prefer probably not going down that road until you know them a little bit. If you have some conversations with them, particularly like if the staffer is from the district or something. Um, so, so one of the most important things, particularly for most researchers, because you are aligned with an institution, is make sure that you keep them informed. You want to work with your institution's government relations people. There are restrictions if you work for a state institution. Again, you, sometimes you can't use your email, you can't use your um, even the, the work computer or, or the work phone. You know, you have to do it all um, privately. So make sure you know what those rules are locally within your institution, and that can be a 
quick call to your government relations office to find out what those are. And, and also, if you're going even as a private citizen talking about something, make sure that they're aware of what you're doing. And even better, if you can get them to understand the perspective and add this to their list of priorities that they want to lobby on, and they actually are lobbying typically. Um, and again, we talk a little bit about inviting your legislator to visit, sort of have a show and tell of the work that you do and, and how the request that you have of them impacts that work. And again, if you're bringing them to your institution, then definitely make sure that you're, the higher up the powers that be are aware of this and have, have approved it. Um, and lastly, always offer to be a resource. Again, you don't necessarily have to be an expert, but they really do look to um, people in situations such as yours as researchers, as clinicians, as physicians, or, or whatever you happen to be, um, as, as resources for them when they have questions. So they may actually come back and ask you something in a couple of weeks totally unrelated to the question that they brought you to their office. Um, and that's fine. That's great. And you don't have to know the answer right away, but go and find it very quickly. Um, and um, and their, their time frame for these things is usually like 24 hours. Like, can you get me this answer by tomorrow? Sometimes it's by today. So expect that sort of fast pace. So you can, um, again, offer to be a resource. They call you. If you don't have that information immediately, you know, get it right to them as soon as you can. Um, and again, we talked a little bit earlier about the power of, of strong advocacy and the importance of, of, of working together on this. So I don't want you to feel that you are alone. Um, as Winston mentioned at the beginning, we have um, some tools to help you. We're there to support each other in this. Um, and here are some tools, and again, we're going to um, make these presentations available to you so you don't have to um, write this down or what typo in this one, sorry. So at, um, right now on the NAPCAG website, we have a list of talking points for primary care research. Um, but additional one-pagers and talking points and a toolkit, how to find who your legislator is and contact them, um, you know, what their Twitter handle, those types of things, you can find at stfm.org and then click on the the button that says advocacy up at the top. You can always contact me. That's my email um, address, in, or you can call me. I'm happy to help with anything, even if it's if you have a one pager and you'd like me to take a look at it to help edit it. Happy to do that, and 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 again give you some of the sort of background of what's going on in Washington on the Hill. You know when you are ready to to go in and have those visits. The next year's Family Medicine Advocacy Summit is May 21st and 22nd. That's correct, but I forgot to change the 17 to 18. So that'll be coming up next spring. Um, and it's an election year. We may um, fill up fairly fast. Also, and I think this is one of the most important things that may be useful to you, going from this quick, short webinar on, on how to lobby, and I know I've gone very fast, or how to advocate, excuse me, I even find myself saying that. Um, there is a free online advocacy course at STFM. You do have to register for it, um, but, you, but that's mainly to get the completion certificate and stuff. It's not, it, there's no cost to it. Um, and it has, there's five modules. They're very brief. You can go through all of the modules in under 45 minutes and click on all the little video clips and things, and it's still only 45 minutes. Or you can skip and just pick one module over the other. Um, you know, how do you write a one pager? The visit will cover some of the stuff that I have. How do you get started? How do you just even make a phone call to get an appointment? Um, these, um, this uh, course has some of that information for you. So with that, um, as Winston mentioned, in the fall, I think it's the 17th of November, we are going to have a pre-con, um, which will be a longer, it'll be more like a four hour session going over some of this stuff and sort of what the latest is on um, on um, primary care research funding. Um, so again, feel free to contact me at any time. I look forward to helping you in this work. I look forward to hearing your successes and um, potential failures, but we'll move on from them. And um, just let me know if there's anything else that I can do, and I will switch and change. Hey, Hope. Yep. Uh, Hope, Jake had a very 
a concrete question here, which I think is a good one. Uh, can you provide advice on how to get an initial meeting? He's called, but only has an option to leave a message. He's introduced himself as a constituent, defending a position, and left a callback number, but no calls have been returned. Uh, what advice can you give to Jake? Um, well, I, 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 tr I tried to answer that a little earlier. Jake, I don't know whether you were calling the Washington office or the local office. And I, either way, I have to say that this is sort of a new phenomenon um, since the inauguration, really, with um, a lot of the um, districts and states and members not having um, town halls and things. So there's other ways um, to do that. And, and, and it's a little indirect, and it may be more time consuming. But if, I mean, if they're not answering the phone, it's because they're not looking for um, to talk to somebody about it. But frequently, they are out in the community. So they may be at a, at a Kiwanis Club meeting. They may be at a Rotary Club meeting. Um, their district supervisor is, may be superintendent of schools, or there may be somebody in, um, you know, one of the PTA members. There are ways to sort of connect locally that may be easier than just calling the Washington office. And again, I don't know whether you tried Washington or the local office. Um, He's calling it local office. Local office. So I would um, try the Washington office and to leave a message and see if, if they will um, call you back. Um, and, and you can say, I'm trying to set up a meeting locally. I haven't had much success. The other thing that you can do is, and I can help you identify who the scheduler is, because obviously they're not answering the phone for you. Um, and then you can email that person and say, I'd like to meet with the representative or senator when they're back in whatever town you're in. So those are ways to do it. And we can talk um, further offline, Jake, if you'd like. Yeah, and the other uh, caveat that I'll put out there is um, oftentimes, like you, you did, Jake, I'll, I'll use the doctor card. You know, I, I've done A-B testing where when I've just introduced myself as a constituent, oftentimes it doesn't work. If I get somebody on the line and I say, um, this is Dr. Leo, oftentimes I get through. And oftentimes I'll, I'll ask for that health uh, legislative aid and specifically and then that will oftentimes will give me like one point person that I can contact or sometimes will give me the, their email address and then that, that way you have one person who's responsible for your communication and then if you contact the Washington office maybe you can back your way into somebody at the local office uh, and then hope Deb had a question about uh, do you want us to try to make a meeting for this August when the representative is at home or do you want us to wait uh, for more information, talking points from us? Um, well, talking points are things we will send out right after this within the next day or two. Um, so, but yes, August would be great. Um, and now would be the time to try setting that up. They're actually back in the district now this week. It's a district uh, work period. It's 4th of July recess. Um, whether they're actually home or on, on vacation, I don't know. A lot of them are home, but trying to get an appointment for right now, this week is not um, potentially useful. Um, but maybe, you know, we missed, you may have missed a parade yesterday that they were in, um, but there are other opportunities. So, but now is a good time to try to make some time in August to meet with them. Oh, I'm switching. Okay, switch my slides, Winston, to you, I think. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. All right, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the medical director of the Graham Center. I'm also the chair of the Research Advocacy Committee. Uh, I'm very grateful for Hope, Hannah, uh, and you all for joining this uh, webinar. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, there really is no alternative team or B team, <laughs> you guys are really the team uh, that we are depending on to uh, reach out to your uh, Congress people and senators. So once again, we really appreciate you uh, participating in this webinar and taking on this, this very important responsibility for primary care research. By the end of uh, this talk, I hope you guys can list two NAPCRAG uh, legislative priorities. 
List two ways that researchers can get involved with advocacy efforts and describe how to craft a clear, concise advocacy message. Um, during your meeting, you're going to have to be able to articulate uh, an answer to this question. So why should we invest in primary care research? And instead of making this rhetorical, I do want you guys to think about it. Um, and so why don't we take a minute and if, if people could either answer in the questions box, uh, you can also raise your hand or if you want to, us to unmute you, we can do that as well if you think it's easier just to talk about it. But why don't we just take a minute to uh, answer this question or let me know that you want to talk and I will unmute you. Uh, and I just wanted to get a sense of where, what you guys are thinking about. Um, and once again, there's not, there's not a right answer here. And I think this is actually a very difficult thing to articulate. Uh, and so some of this is uh, collating or aggregating some of your responses, getting you to think about it. But some of it is for us so that we can uh, get a sense of what are the types of tax that you would take when you're having this conversation. So let's take a, a, a minute. You can think about it, type your answer here in the question box or raise your hand. All right, I see Jake has written, effective primary care saves money and improves health, and primary care research leads to effective primary care. I think that's a, a reasonable uh, narrative there. Uh, Doug Harley talks about population health. Uh, David Mayer talks about uh, because primary care is an important part of the healthcare system, and a spectrum of what is seen in primary care differs from that in specialty care. That's an important point. Uh, Jake talks about improved health, strengthens communities, decreases reliance on entitlement programs. Oh, I like that, especially uh, I, I think your conservative districts will, will like that line of reasoning. Uh, Doug Harley says that healthy community saves money. Uh, Vanessa talks about being able uh, to articulate the impact of primary care research, how it affects communities, improves health is a big speaking point and definitely something that you're going to have to wrap your heads around uh, as you're going into these meetings. All right, well, if people come up with other ideas, just please go ahead and continue to share them here and we'll continue to read them. Uh, I see Deb talks about good primary care unifies the urban rural divide. That's true, uh, especially in family medicine. Uh, you know, family physicians are in rural communities, urban communities, uh, and definitely are integrated to the fabrics the fabric of communities. Uh, at the Graham Center recently had a primary care forum, which is a event on Capitol Hill um, about primary care research. And just to uh, get a sense of some of the speaking points, I just wanted to play uh, a couple of clips from that event so you can get a sense of what other people, how other people answered this question. Primary care practitioner. Just some background, this is Andy Bindman, who's the former director of ARC, uh, but is now at UCSF, he's a general internist. ...to be able to do their job, they need scientifically valid answers to these questions. Uh, without the research to answer these questions, patients risk that they will not benefit from effective disease prevention strategies. They risk that they will not have their symptoms rapidly and accurately diagnosed to determine the best available treatment options. They risk that they will not be educated in a way that will enable them to fully engage in decision making with their health care providers. Ultimately, primary care is the backbone of patient centered care. Care that is not focused on diseases, as is much of the case of the NIH, but on the people who have them. Primary care is where we need to be doing the research, not on genomics on, uh, and, and protonomics, but on what Roy Ziegelstein and Hopkins and others have called personomics. That is understanding uh, what it, uh, it, uh, it is about how uh, diseases affect people's lives and that we can, uh, by studying the patients and learning about them, ensure that we are learning 
that the questions that matter to patients and are designing approaches to prevention, diagnosis, and treatment that align with their practical realities and their values. Uh, Jake is saying he likes that it's not focused on disease, but the people who have them. Yeah, that's uh, as Hope was mentioning. You know, bringing it back to the individual level is is a very uh, winning strategy. <clears throat> Let me play this other clip. We're developing from our data, whether it be from clinical trials or the growing amount of real world evidence that comes from primary care and other places, is how does that evidence get fed back in a systematic way to the front lines of care? It's what some have called bringing knowledge back to practice, right? We need to learn from practice. And we've heard lots of really great examples today of how, what you can learn from practice. But what we do, uh, we don't in fact have that infrastructure that makes sure that we address the gaps in the evidence that we're developing and bringing it back quickly to the front lines of care where it can really make a difference for our patients. It's been studied and is known that it can take as many as 17 years on average for knowledge to be returned back to the front lines of, of care. Well, during that time, patients who could benefit from this knowledge are missing out. And there's really strong uh, evidence to suggest that this is also contributing to health care disparities in this country because the evidence is coming back in a non-systematic way. It's coming back on the basis, again, of who has resources, not on the basis of who has a need for the information. Primary care practitioners to be able to do. Sorry, I was on a loop. All right. Um, hopefully, that gives you some additional fodder for how to answer that question and and other uh, things that you could consider. Uh, so I don't have to convince you all that our healthcare system is broken. We spend a lot more in healthcare than other countries, but don't have great outcomes to show for it. This is from a National Academy of Medicine report of the $2.5 trillion we spend on healthcare, 30% is spent on waste. So activity services that provide minimal or little value or negative value to the system or missed opportunities that increase expenses. The Affordable Care Act, uh, of course, uh, mainly covered coverage and did less to cover to address costs and quality. And yet the one agency aimed at fixing our broken health system is constantly under siege, and that would be the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And this was written by a former Republican Senator, Bill Frist. Our mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable. It has four broad themes uh, that go along, it's, that align with its mission. So accessibility is what studies insurance coverage, and the reduction of disparities, making care safer, reducing errors, uh, and healthcare associated infections, making it more effective, so disseminating evidence to healthcare providers, and making it more efficient. ARC researches whole patients in real world settings. Uh, this is from a famous uh, study looking at the ecology of care. Uh, so the vast majority of funding uh, goes to the smallest box, which is the academic medical center. Even though most of the uh, care is delivered in primary care, which is the largest uh, delivery platform in the U.S. And I think somebody, I think Jake had mentioned, or maybe it was David who mentioned that a lot of uh, the research is done in specialty offices or in academic medical centers, but most of the care is delivered in primary care. Uh, and I think that resonates with a lot of us, which is, you know, primary care providers uh, trust evidence that is done in primary care settings. Uh, and that, in other words, evidence-based practice requires practice-based evidence. About $48 billion is spent on health research. Uh, the vast majority of that goes to the NIH, uh, mostly uh, on basic sciences research. About two billion goes to health services research, or about four percent of the healthcare uh, research spend, and less than one percent goes to um, ARC. So ARC's funding is important because most of um, family medicine researchers or primary care researchers um, are not doing basic science research. We're not studying just the heart or just the lung. 
uh, we're also focusing on patients holistically, and that does, is not a lateral, uh, does not have natural alignment with the NIH. So between 2011 and 2014, uh, failing medicine departments received 0.29% of NIH funding, or $71 million. ARC's portfolio spans the spectrum of care. They had a, an extension program that helped practices transform. They have a learning collaborative that helps integrate behavioral health and primary care. They funded this uh, transitions of care redesign project that was uh, out of the family medicine department that demonstrated savings and money and reduced ED uh, visits. And of course, it supports practice-based research networks. Despite these benefits, uh, in the president's most recent budget, ARC's budget was uh, reduced by $52 million, or 16%, to $272 million. Uh, and in that uh, budget justification, they also talked about consolidating ARC into NIH uh, under a new institute called the National Institute for Research on Safety and Quality. So safety and quality are important aspects of primary care, but just to give you a sense that you know primary care really is not a priority for HHS, within that same document, there are 15 references to primary care. 10 of those references are uh, referred to a direct primary care initiative. Uh, two of them, two of the references talk about eliminating primary care programs. One of the uh, references is to the primary care workforce. One is to teaching health centers. And another one is to care of American Indians, and there are zero mentions of primary care research. Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, Price talked about how um, he thinks that the NIH could assume the important duties of ARC and then reduce or decrease redundancy. So there's this narrative that ARC is redundant and that its um, function is duplicated within NIH. Here's another uh, exchange on the Hill that speaks to that narrative. This was at an appropriations hearing recently, and a senator asked, can we move these areas, or ARC, into NIH without creating a new institute? And this is the response from the director of NIH who said, we could move the portfolio and staff over and across the NIH. Uh, which is another way of saying ARC could be subsumed into the into NIH without retaining its uh, unique functions or being its own standalone institute. Dr. Amy Byman, who was the gentleman who you heard in the video, wrote this health affairs blog, uh, highlighting a couple important things. First, the redundancy. So Pocori spends 500 million on comparative effectiveness research. CMI spends a billion dollars on studying delivery system innovation, and NIH spends $1.5 billion on health services research. Um, so there are redundancies. I mean, I don't, I don't think that that is an inaccurate portrayal. But there are some pretty unique functions that ARC um, retains, things like patient safety, quality, primary care research, and putting evidence into practice. In order to retain those unique functions, um, he argues that it really needs to maintain its visibility as a standalone institute. And he also talks about potential benefits, that there would be more stable funding. I mean, ARC is constantly under siege. Um, and that there's opportunities to better translate discovery into practice. So if you have an agency or an institute that's better integrated into the NIH, um, in theory, there are potential ways that uh, you could take those discoveries and put them into practice um, more quickly. One of the other things that you're going to have to be able to articulate is how ARC is different from PCORI, CDC, and NIH. Uh, here I've tried to go through that exercise with respect to the types of research funded. Now this may not be a great uh, tactic because uh, PCORI and NIH also do health services research. A different strategy would be to look at the core mission of the agencies. So NIH studies diseases, PCORI studies patients, CDC studies communities, and RX studies systems, or how to deliver the right care in the right setting. And I think these 
Missions are very important. They affect the questions that are asked, the populations included, the methods used, and the outcomes assessed. And this is really reflected in their mission statement. So NIH seeks fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems. PCORI helps people make informed healthcare decisions. CDC fights disease and supports communities. And ARC produces evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable. And really without ARC, there's a gap in our understanding of healthcare. A third thing that you're going to have to do is talk about how your research or primary care research in general affects patients in the district. The other day, not the other day, but <laughs> several years ago, <clears throat> I was talking to uh, the staffer of my congressman's office. And I was talking to him about ARC, the importance of ARC, and I could just see his eyes glazing over. Um, but he became a lot more engaged when I started talking about my preventive care which is an online tool that helps increase the adoption of preventive services. And he became very interested when I said that that tool is available to 100,000 people in his district um, because of ARC funding. So you're gonna have to make the research relatable to individuals in your, um, in, the, in the district. And I, I do think that that's a doable task. I mean, just think about how, you know, people who study viruses or genes are able to do that. I think that we, we should be able to do this as well. So here's the asks. There's three asks, $364 million for ARC funding, that we want ARC to be transitioned into the NIH as the Institute for Primary Care and Health Services Research, and that we need a National Academy of Medicine study to articulate a vision and blueprint for the Institute within NIH. Let me pause there for a second and see if we have any questions about those three asks, because I think it's important for you guys to understand the asks, and if you have any concerns, this would be a great time to talk about them. All right, Jake asks, what if we have to prioritize among these three? <clears throat> uh, which is the most important? And it, I, think, I, I think Hope would say that it's not our job to prioritize among the three, but Hope, I'll, I'll ask you for your opinion as well. Well, I would view this really as um, three parts of a continuum as opposed to three separate asks. So right now, the, the president's budget cut funding for ARC. We want to go back up to where ARC was a couple years ago before the, the latest sort of decreases started happening. And we need that money for this current fiscal year, fiscal year 18 that starts um, October 1. Because any of these other issues in the budget, getting rid of ARC, moving it into NIH, all of those take time. So the, the idea of having a National Academy of Medicine study is, okay, how do we do this appropriately? Um, and, and as part of that, that vision and blueprint that gets to that third point is when you transition ARC into NIH, primary care needs to be visible. It has to be an institute for primary care so that even though, even if it's health services research and a portion of that is primary care, there's also primary care that is not health services research and that's the only home, ARC right now is the only home for primary care research that there is. So um, hopefully you don't feel like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but I really do view it as sort of a temporal continuum, and all three relate to the same thing. And the real ask is we need support for a home for primary care research within the United States government. Uh, and Jake asks, is this a done deal? Is transitioning ARC into NIH a done deal? Um, I hope I'll let you take that on. Not at all. Um, in fact, if, if we are to move it, um, we need to socialize both members of Congress and the NIH establishment as well that this wouldn't be a bad thing with the caveats that we have up here, that there's a vision and a blueprint for primary care and that it becomes, it's funded at a reasonable level. Um, so that, that's how I would respond to that question. 
Yeah, and um, you know, Hope and I and the Research Advocacy Committee, I think, envisioned three <clears throat> possibilities. You know, one is that ARC disappears and that there's nothing in the NIH. The second one is that ARC gets integrated into the NIH as um, something that has a primary care uh, mission. And then the third um, is that ARC is, is retained as, as is. I guess, Hope, do you think that there's any chance that ARC could be retained as a, its own agency? Um, yeah, that's possible. The problem is we've seen just as recently as two years ago uh, attempts to terminate it totally and not fund it at all. So we have one sort of force on that side, but even without just terminating it in one year, we have seen a slide in funding. It's near-death experience is, is sort of happening as, as we go along. In the last, since FY16, we've already lost $40 million in, in funding. So, you know, death by a thousand cuts. So even if it retains the way it is, it's not optimal. We actually started working on this question of where could we move ARC to potentially with NIH or could we get a toehold with NIH even if ARC stays the same, because of concerns about the funding going down. Um, additionally, there is money that goes to ARC from PCORI, from the um, PCOR Trust Fund, and that's up for reauthorization in 2019, and it's not clear that that will actually happen. So there are, there's real uh, efforts on the horizon that may be counterproductive to primary care research. Yeah, and I think hope Hope and I and the Research Advocacy Committee, you know, I think our negative fantasy is it completely disappears and there is no home for primary care research. I know, you know, we've talked to a lot of NAPCREC members and people have talked about how ARC really could be even more primary care friendly. It's, it has not necessarily been the bastion of, um, of, of primary care research that we would like it to be. Um, and that other places are doing primary care research like CMMI, PCORI, HRSA, um, and that's really what we think the National Academy of Academy Medicine study uh, could could help articulate is um, is to create a framework for um, for where this primary care home could could sit and to declare that really we do need a a home for primary care research because as you guys could see from the budget justifications there's not that impetus there's not there, that is not seen as a vision that we need to implement. Um, David says, uh, Trump administration is not enforcing payments to the court trust fund, so funding is being cut on many grants using that funding at ARC. Yeah, Thanks, David. Hey, David, I just found out last week when we met with the new director of ARC, the reason for those funding cuts, that the core trust fund was not pulling in the revenue that it typically had, and a lot of that has to do with a lot of the insurance um, companies getting out of uh, of the Obamacare kind of situation. So it wasn't getting the revenue. They still don't know how much revenue. So they cut those grants by, or asked you to come up with a new budget of 50%. Um, but they do hope, they think there's more coming in now, and they do hope they'll be able to give you some some of that back, if that helps. I know we had discussed that at um, STFM a little bit, but I didn't have an answer for you until just recently. Uh, so feel free to continue uh, asking us questions about the asks. Uh, this is another uh, interactive part of the, the webinar. Uh, you don't necessarily need to write down the story, but uh, we want you to start thinking about stories. So start thinking about a story that you think would uh, demonstrate the value of primary care research and or art. It doesn't necessarily even have to be the research you're doing. It can be research that other people are doing. Um, and, and thinking about how do you make that applicable to the people in your community? How do you articulate that that research is, is really helping uh, people in your community? I, once again, I'm going to take a, another minute because I do want people to, to think about it. Um, if you want to raise your hand and talk, I'm happy to unmute you. Um, if you have a, um, a, a a vignette or um, a a story that you would you would use during your talk. And now is a good time to to just pitch the the story and get reactions. 
uh, from it, and hopefully that will spur ideas uh, for other people. All right, David is raising his hand. I'm going to unmute you, David. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. So um, I have a, a grant for Mark that's uh, funded by the uh, PCOR Trust Fund, so I'm very uh, conscious of this um, decreased revenue. But two, we we it involves three major projects, and two of those projects. Um, are very uh, concrete. One involves improving discharge processes from skilled nursing facilities where all the issues with hospital discharges are even worse. Um, got lots of stories, for instance, about warfarin being mishandled. Um, patient who went for a month without getting followed up and ended up getting readmitted because of poor discharge planning from a SNF. Um, and secondly, funding a PBRN study on approaches to improving care of chronic pain. So these are all, um, these are, those are two projects that we're doing that are funded by ARC. Previous work had to do with um, improving chronic disease care through uh, approaches to health IT. Um, so lots of, um, funding that I've had from ARC that uh, has direct impact on uh, people uh, here and elsewhere. And I, I think two things I would follow up with. One is um, <laughs> opioids are on everyone's mind. So I think you know your representatives and senators will be primed to hear about ways to address chronic pain. Uh, and another thing that uh, Ben, uh, ben Wait, Will Miller uh, had mentioned during the at the in-person uh, session at SDFM was that he said that uh, instead of using uh, the elderly or geriatric patients, he always calls them grandma and grandpa, and he says that that uh, seems to resonate or, or um, to get the person listening to your story more engaged about about the story. All right. Any other stories? That's that's very helpful, David. I think that's a great. That those are great lead lead-ins. All right. Why don't we move on? Oh, Vanessa, I'm unmuting you. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. I'm not used to all the little thingies on my uh, on my computer here. Um, yeah, so I, I was just going to talk about um, some of the work we do with uh, practice-based research networks, uh, where through AHRQ funding, uh, we have folks actually go to primary care practices throughout the United States, including rural areas, and um, teach doctors how to better look at their at their patients, uh, look at the data in their health records, and then really use that to improve the care in that community for that patient population and with, with projects that include things like looking at opioids and medication safety, um, uh, alcohol abuse screening, and, um, and things like that to really try to help not just improve people one time at a time, but really looking at the broader picture of improving practices. That's great, Vanessa. And I, uh, I actually think that we're at a huge advantage. You know, if you're doing research in an academic medical center, um, you know, your network of, of patients is is somewhat limited. You know, in primary care, we have these very uh, decentralized research net research enterprise that goes into rural communities, um, and so you can actually say that this research is being conducted not in the ivory tower, but in your backyard. And I think that's a an important message. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a great story, Vanessa. I think the only if you could if you had a, an example of how some of your interventions helped um, the doctor improve the care of the patients, I think that would be one additional thing to to try and weave into um, your statements. But otherwise, I thought I thought that's really good. 
All right, if people have additional things, just please raise your hand or put it in the uh, question box and, and we'll, we'll, we can talk about them. Uh, as a reminder, uh, during the Hill visits, like Hope said, remember to introduce yourself. If you're going by yourself, uh, you may not have to assign roles, but if you're going with other people, just uh, it's helpful to explicitly uh, declare the rules. Somebody should introduce the group. Somebody re needs to be responsible for communicating the asks, and you know everyone in the group can can uh, chime in with stories. Uh, Hope, I'm going to throw it to you to talk about this next slide. Sure. So we, we've talked about some of this already, um, but some of the strategies that you may want to use, especially um, one, just to start for comfort level, but two, because it's uh, always more important to have other folks with you in terms of, of the weight of the opinion not being just your own, but having allies um, and developing coalitions. So engaging other faculty members to, that care about this issue, to have them get involved as well. And as uh, Winston talked about sort of doing some joint visits where you're not doing it by yourself, but you're bringing in a couple of fellow researchers. It'd be great if you could bring in patients. Um, that is amazingly important and really makes a difference. It's funny, sometimes when you have um, faculty going in and talking, we always say bring a resident or a student because they're really well valued, but bringing in a patient is even um, a higher commodity and very, very helpful because then, then the, the legislator is seeing that tie-in between what they do and the specific recipient of the, of the care in the community. Um, so, for example, um, Vanessa, you talked about your PBRN. Um, you obviously uh, have some sort of patient engagement involvement if you have somebody on your advisory board or whatever a patient that might be somebody who's knowledgeable enough to be able to come in and um, do some of these visits um, with you um, also looking again engaging some allies in your community um, you know if there are nursing homes that are having issues in your research deals with that engage them to come along and to, to sort of sign up for the need for this uh, research or funding for this research um, one of the other things that I think is really important, I touched on it a little bit, but we recognize it's obviously easier for extroverts to do this than introverts. However, introverts can do it too. Um, it's, a, it's skill that you need to develop as opposed to just your own personality. So I think we've covered some of the ways that you can do that even as an introvert, you know, by preparation ahead of time, and it's only 15 minutes, even if it might be an agonizing 15 minutes for you. Um, the reality is most people, when they go and do these visits, come away thinking, oh, that was kind of fun. I don't mind doing that again. Um, and I think if you talk to any of your peers that have done it, and, and I think a couple of you, in answer to the first poll question, have done it as well. And, um, you know, what were your feelings afterwards? Was it was it feeling that you may have accomplished something, that you were beginning something, even if it didn't reach fruition? So those are things that, that can be important. And again, let me reiterate, meet with your government relations folks at your institution to make sure they're aware of what you're doing, not for them to stop what you're doing, um, but you need to know what your parameters are, what the guardrails are. And again, you might be able to get them to support your position. We had um, one of the folks that was at STFM and they went and talked to their um, GR department and got this on their list of priorities. So that was really important. Um, and again, remember you're not alone, both in terms of, of preparation for this in actually doing it, but, but continuing on through the year and into the future. And we do have a, um, I guess, a, I don't know exactly what, the Connect community on the NAPCRAG website for folks that have have either taken the webinar or taken the class um, that we do at SAFM and that we will do at NAPCRAG in November, um, where you can pose questions and start talking with your peers. Like, oh, I faced this. Anybody have a good answer to this question? Um, so um, hopefully we'll, we'll, be, we'll be there to support you as you move forward with this. Thanks, Hope. Yeah, David, uh, Rochelle was at the STFM uh, training this past spring, so she'd be, it'd be good to coordinate your efforts with her at the University of Missouri. Uh, 
So we do have homework. I probably should have come up with a better term for this, but uh, but our ask for you is to set up a meeting with your representative or senator's office to discuss the three asks, um, see them at their office, speak with them at a town hall, or invite them and or invite them to your institution, uh, and then report back to Hope Winberg and myself. Um, if you're not a clinician, you know, bring a clinician if you want. If you think that would be a more powerful way to communicate your point, uh, and consider bringing a patient to the visit. And like I mentioned, coordinate uh, your efforts with others. And with that, we're done. Um, <laughs> you guys can feel free to declare your next steps. If you, uh, if you want to write down what you think you're going to do next and help us uh, hold you accountable, that'd be great. If you don't want to do that, that's OK, too. Uh, at this time, we're done with the content part of our webinar. So, and we'd love to hear any questions or uh, just get your feedback about how we can best support you in your next steps. Hey, Vanessa, I'm going to unmute you. Um, yeah, I think one thing that I probably don't understand well enough, and it might be in the tip sheets, and you can just tell me to go there, is um, kind of the successes of HRP with past funding, you know, like to say that it's a, I, I feel comfortable with the other parts of the ask because I think I, I can understand them, but, but asking like for that specific amount of money, I feel a little less able to make that. I need to specific tip sheet or, or if that's something you want to respond to here. And we, we do have some talking points that we'll send you, and part of that one pager does include some of that, sort of why it's important and why it's needed. Um, there is also, actually on the ARC website, um, a couple of pages where they highlight specific efforts that they have. Um, Evidence Now is the big primary care one. There are a couple of other um, things. We can, um, we can send that to you as well or include it. I'm not quite sure how we're posting this and, and giving you a link or something like that. We'll we'll get that all to you. Did that answer your question, Vanessa? Yes, I was just about to respond to you. That is the question, because like, I mean, I know why primary care research and why HRQ funding is important, it's smallly for me, but I think exactly what you're saying, kind of, some of the other big name programs that would be good to, to be aware of is, is exactly what I'm looking for. So yes, that's exactly it. Great, yeah, we can get that to you. Other questions? All right, well, hearing none, um, I just wanted to thank you all for joining the webinar for your attention and for your participation. And I want to thank Hope and Hannah, uh, Hannah Bruins at NABCRE for helping us uh, get this organized and just uh, be on the lookout for additional materials. And please let us know how it's been going with your efforts. All right, thanks everyone. Bye, thanks to it as well. Take care everyone.